All right, Bible and Daily Lifers, here we are. We are continuing through the New Testament, and right now we are in Matthew chapter 19. Now, there's some interesting stuff here and some some difficult stuff, so let's see if we can tackle it. I think we can. I think we've been doing pretty good together. Chapter 19. When Jesus had finished these sayings, talking about the forgiveness in, that in chapter 18, he went away from Galilee and he entered the region, read, read, the region of Judea beyond the Jordan. So going into the Judean area now, moving from the Galilee. And large crowds followed him and he healed them. Uh, Jesus gets the big crowds and he heals them. It's what he does. Now, the Pharisees came up to test him by asking this. <clears throat> Is it lawful? To divorce one's wife for any cause. Now, there's the key. Any cause. And he answered, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? Jesus does something interesting here. They're asking a question about divorce. And Jesus brings it all the way back to the creation. And in the creation, Jesus says that God created them male and female. And the male and the female join together, and the two create one. This is what we learned about in the book of Genesis. So always go back to Genesis, always go back to the beginning. And so Jesus, rather than jumping right into the divorce question, the tearing apart, <clears throat> the two that have become one, he goes back to the beginning. And he says, therefore, because of that, because God had made them male and female, and the two become one, because of that, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, joined together. And the two become one flesh. Now, this is a mystery. And so they are no longer two, but they're one. And what therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. Now, a lot of wedding vows still will say this, what God has joined together, let no, no one separate. Now, one of the things that you learn about marriage in the scripture is that marriage is a picture of Jesus in the church. Jesus is faithful to the church. Uh, Jesus is, does not have a wandering eye. He's not dissatisfied with his bride. He knows who his bride is and he's committed to us. And so <clears throat> they said to him this after Jesus says that, they, they asked the question of divorce and Jesus talks about the creation and talks about marriage and the two becoming one. And they're like, well, you didn't really answer the question. And they said, why then did Moses command one to give a, a certificate of divorce and send her away? So in the Old Testament, they were allowed to give a certificate of divorce to the wife and not to the husband. It's kind of interesting. It was very, quite a patriarchal society. And so it goes towards the, towards the woman. And Jesus said to them, because of the hardness of your heart, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it wasn't so. So he, again, he goes all the way back to the beginning. And he said, and I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. Now, this is uh, kind of interesting and a little bit hairy. Let's see if we can pull it apart a little bit. Uh, first of all, the question was, can you divorce your wife for any reason? Now, <clears throat> we, we already said that the rabbis were able to bind the law on you or loose the law on you. Well, there was a rabbi, both Pharisees, a named Hillel. And Hillel, he believed that you could divorce your wife if she didn't cook your eggs right. So just get rid of her. You know, she's not pleasing to you. So, you know, get rid of her. Uh, Shammai Another Pharisee rabbi who interprets the scripture, um, he was much stricter. He said only if there's marital infidelity. Now, the reason that marital infidelity is such a big issue is because, again, in marriage, the picture of marriage is a picture of Jesus in the church. And Jesus is not unfaithful to us. He will never be unfaithful to us. So, the, the picture of a marriage that has infidelity in it doesn't, doesn't work with Jesus in the church. Jesus isn't going to give you a certificate of divorce. Jesus isn't going to be unfaithful to you. <clears throat> and so, so Jesus is saying 
that certainly a reason to give a certificate of divorce. First of all, when Moses gave it, Jesus said, it's because your hearts are hard. Now, um, there, and, and, when, and when you look at that, it's not necessarily just addressing infidelity that breaks the bond. Uh, it's the hardness of heart that, you know, we're just not getting along. And if you if you've worked with enough marriages and you've been in a marriage and you know about these things, you know how hard our hearts can be and how difficult we can be to get along with and how difficult our marriages can be. So, so Jesus gives the exception, sexual immorality, because that changes the whole sort of picture. But then he says, marries another, commits adultery. Now that's kind of a kind of a, a, a tough thing or makes her an adulterer. You see, because in the ancient world, if you divorced your wife, probably nobody is going to pick her up again. So now she's just sort of left out there to, to do what? I mean, maybe to just cohabitate with people or whatever. Um, but it's in this particular area that, you know, we need to, we need to extend grace, but we need to, to recognize that marriage is a serious thing. And it's, we're supposed to stick together, and but we don't. And in the Old Testament, you know, they gave him a certificate of divorce. And so, <clears throat> you know, we see grace extended, but, but marriage is serious, and, and Jesus takes marriage serious. So the disciples said to him this. They said, if that's the case of a man and a wife, then it's better to not marry. Well, um, that's not really such a good question because they're saying, well, if you can't divorce, then then why even get married? Well, you, you shouldn't go into marriage thinking that maybe you're going to get divorced. But Jesus said to them, he answers, it's sort of odd, actually. Jesus always answers questions differently than, um, than they're given. <laughs> he's Jesus. He said, not everybody can receive this saying. So he's going to say something that's kind of tough. He said, but to whom it's given? There are eunuchs. You know what a eunuch is? A eunuch is somebody who's emasculated. So there are eunuchs who have been so from birth, and there are people who from birth have, um, you know, particular issues like that. And he said, and there are eunuchs who have been made that way by men. Now, eunuchs were a little more common in the ancient world um, when kings had harems, uh, when kings had queens, they would bring these men into the circle and they would castrate them. They would make them eunuchs so that they wouldn't go after the women. Now, uh, being castrated like that um, probably didn't take away the urgings and the desires and the inner things that happened in, in the guy that they did it to, but he couldn't do the deed with the, with the girls in the harem that the king had. And there are eunuchs who've made themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. Uh, let the one who is able to receive it, receive it. Um, that very well may be talking about um, those who are celibate, uh, I met a guy, I interviewed a guy who used to write for um, Christian publications, and I met a guy named John Stott. He used to be the chaplain to the Queen of England, and he believed that he had the gift of celibacy, that God had given him that gift, and he never, he never married. He uh, traveled the world, he taught, he wrote a lot of books, um, but he never married, and he said he had no, de no desire so. So, um, you know, try to find the ancient context, but but then again, you know, Jesus is saying, you know, that marriage is a marriage is a serious thing. Verse thirteen. Then the children who were brought to him, that he might lay hands on them, but the disciples rebuked him, and people were bringing their kids. You know, I'll pray for the kids. You know, bless the kids, Jesus. And the disciples are get the kids out of here. There's kids, get them out of here. And Jesus said, Let the little children come to me, and don't hinder them. For to such belongs the kingdom of heaven. And he laid his hands on them, and they went away. Jesus, he he blesses the kids. And he's a little angry that his disciples are trying to keep kids away. Um, you know, we try to train up kids and train them up in the way that they should go in the home. Uh, you know, in church, we try to do Sunday school. We try to teach them, you know, all of the things that, all of the things that they need to know. And then uh, verse 16, and behold, a man came up to him. And he said, teacher, what good deed must I do to, to gain eternal life? Well, he asked the wrong question. You don't, you don't get into heaven by good deeds. You get into heaven by trusting Jesus Christ, what he has done for you. But this guy, he thinks it's good, good deeds. And Jesus said to them, um, why do you ask me about what's good? There's only one who's good. Why are you coming to me? Well, the guy's coming to him because uh, Jesus is the only one that's good. He's, he's God in the flesh. And Jesus said, if you would enter life... Keep the commandments. 
So if you want to do it by what you're going to do, then just keep all the commandments. And he said, which ones? And Jesus said, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, honor your father and mother, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And the young man said, all of these I've kept, what do I still lack? He didn't keep all of those. There's no way in the world that he kept all of those things. So he's got a false estimation of himself, and he still believes that he's a good guy, that he's good enough to get eternal life. And Jesus said, well, um, if you want to be perfect then, go and sell what you possess and give it to the poor, and then you'll have treasure in heaven, and then come and follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. So it's not so much the stuff, but it's what stands in between us and God, what stands in between us and Jesus, what we're, what we're really willing to give up in order to know God and to, and to have God. And Jesus said to his disciples, Truly I say to you, only with difficulty will a rich person enter the kingdom of heaven. But they can. It doesn't say nobody can, no rich person can, but with difficulty. Why? Because they, you, you're trusting in yourself. You're trusting in your own abilities. You're trusting in, in you. And he said, again, I tell you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And so when his disciples heard this, they were astonished. And they said, well, then who can be saved? Who can be saved? And Jesus looked at him and he said, well, with man it's impossible, but with God all things are possible. People put all kinds of barriers, all kinds of things in between them and God, and this guy had his wealth. For him it was his possessions, it was his wealth, it was his position. And then Peter said, see, we've left everything and followed you. What then will we have? And Jesus said this, truly I say to you, in the new world, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will sit on the twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or mothers or children or lands for my sake will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last will be first. Well, you see what happens here is that when you come into the kingdom of God, you do get a hundred brothers and sisters. I have said it before that I grew up in a home with three sisters. I never had any brothers. Now that I'm born again and I'm born into the family of God, I have hundreds of brothers. I have hundreds of brothers. And it says, you know, you, fathers and sisters and mothers and lands. Well, um, I have a lot of places where I am welcomed, homes where I am welcomed, places that I am welcomed because I belong to God. It's amazing. He brings us into this new family, gives us brothers, sisters, mothers, fathers. I have fathers. I have guys that have discipled me and helped me along. I have mothers. I have you know, Christian ladies who, who've been kind to me and good to me. He brings us into this new family. And so we all, we all can have it. Nobody's given up anything. My old pastor used to say, God will never be your debtor. Ever, 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 ever. Never be your debtor. So Bible and Daily Life, um, find us on uh, Facebook. Find us on uh, YouTube. Find us on Spotify. Find us all over the place. Hey, you are loved. You are loved. You are loved. Let's keep working through the New Testament. We're going to do it.